Welcome to CME's lectures on transmission electron microscopy and the lecture on the eval sphere. In the last lecture, I introduced the concept of the reciprocal lattice, a lattice of nodes in reciprocal space where each node corresponds to a possible diffraction vector from a plane with Miller indices HKL. This reciprocal lattice forms the first half of our framework for understanding and interpreting electron diffraction. In this lecture, I'm going to introduce the second half of the framework, namely the eval sphere. To understand the eval sphere, we're going to consider that electron diffraction corresponds to elastic scattering. The incident electron beam is diffracted by the Coulomb field of the sample, and during this diffraction event, there is no energy loss. Therefore, at this scattering event, the energy of the electron beam, and hence its wavelength, both remain constant. However, as we have already seen, there is a momentum change during diffraction. We can describe this on a wave vector diagram. So here, I have a wave vector for the incident electron beam, Ki. Whereas we have previously seen, the length of Ki, its modulus, equals 1 over lambda the wavelength of the electron beam. I'm going to say that here I have some diffraction event. Now the scattering from this event could occur in one of many different directions. So for instance, we could have a diffracted wave vector here. Equally, we could have diffraction in this direction or this direction or one of many different possible directions. Now, while the angle of scattering may change, of course, the length of these diffracted beam wave vectors cannot change. They all have the same length as that of the incident electron beam, 1 over lambda. So, looking just at this plane of scattering, we can see that all these different possible scattering wave vectors will inscribe a circle. That's just looking at one plane. However, we could also have diffraction out of plane. And if we consider the out of plane scattering wave vectors, we can see that the, together they will inscribe a sphere. And this sphere of possible diffracted beam wave vectors is called the eval sphere. Since the radius of the eval sphere has a length of 1 over lambda, we can see that the eval sphere has reciprocal dimensions. And we're now going to interact this sphere with the reciprocal lattice. To look at this interaction, on this slide I have drawn both the eval sphere and a reciprocal lattice. Looking first at the eval sphere, again here we have the wave vector for the incident electron beam, Ki. If there is no interaction, if there is no scattering, then the wave vector carries straight on. Here, we know that in the back focal or diffraction plane, that the incident electron beam gives the direct beam in the diffraction pattern 0, 0, 0. 0, 0, 0 also forms the origin of this reciprocal lattice. So I have also placed this origin at the end of the wave vector for this incident electron beam. Now if we look at the interaction of the eval sphere with the reciprocal lattice, we can see that here there is a node in the reciprocal lattice that is intersected exactly by the surface of this eval sphere. Now for this node, we can draw in a wave vector for the diffracted beam, Kd. And since I am saying that this is the wave vector for the diffracted beam, I can also draw in here the diffraction vector G for this particular reciprocal lattice node. Now we're going to look at the geometry of this scattering for that particular reciprocal lattice node. First of all, we're going to look at the angle of scattering, and I'll say that the semi angle of scattering is theta. From this diagram and by trigonometry, it's clear that the modulus of G, the diffraction vector, divided by 2 equals modulus of kd 
times sine theta. Now we know that g, the diffraction vector, equals d star hkl. Therefore, the modulus of g equals the modulus of d star equals 1 over d. So, we can see that this becomes 1 over 2d hkl equals the length of kd equals 1 over lambda times sine theta. And this expression should look very familiar to you because if we rearrange it, we obtain lambda equals 2d hkl sine theta. In other words, we have obtained the Bragg equation where theta equals theta b, the Bragg angle. Thus, we see that when the eval sphere intersects exactly through a reciprocal lattice node, the plane corresponding to that reciprocal lattice node is at the exact Bragg condition, and so will diffract strongly. Cleaning up that diagram, we can represent this scattering as follows. So we have the incident wave vector Ki. Here I have drawn in some Bragg planes at the angle theta b relative to Ki, scattering at the Bragg angle, leading to diffraction for a plane corresponding to that reciprocal lattice node. Now, in this representation, I have had to make an exaggeration to make the representation compact. Specifically, we know that the electron wavelength, lambda, is much smaller than the typical plane spacing dhkl. Because of that, the length of this wave vector k is going to be much greater than a typical reciprocal lattice spacing d star hkl. So the radius of the sphere for a realistic representation must be much, much greater. Moving on with that, I make that realistic representation of the eval sphere and the reciprocal lattice in this diagram here. Here we have the incident wave vector ki, the diffracted beam wave vector kd, and I have drawn them assuming that we have 200 keV electrons. For 200 keV electrons, the wavelength lambda is approximately equal to 2.5 picometers. To complete the illustration, I have taken a reciprocal lattice for body center cubic phase of iron. This particular node here is once again at the Bragg angle. And this node is for the 0 to 0 plane. And for BCC iron, D020 is approximately equal to 0 0.14 nanometers. The net result is that the length of K, the wave vector, is approximately 50 times greater than the reciprocal lattice spacing, D star. When we draw that in with this very long radius, we can see that the surface of the eval sphere is almost flat. And while this reciprocal lattice is still inclined relative to the incident electron beam, the angle of that inclination is very, very small. As an exercise, you can calculate that angle of inclination and the Bragg angle of theta b and the scattering angle to theta b for this case of 200 keV electrons and BCC iron when exciting this 0 to 0 reciprocal lattice node. To summarize, I have introduced the eval sphere, a sphere in reciprocal space with a radius of k equal to 1 over lambda. And we have seen that when we interact this sphere with the reciprocal lattice, and when the surface of that sphere intersects exactly through the middle of a reciprocal lattice node, the plane corresponding to that node is at the exact Bragg condition and so will diffract strongly. So far, we have only looked at this in the case of two beam electron diffraction, where only one of the reciprocal lattice nodes is intersected by the eval sphere, and hence we only have strong diffraction on one plane. Giving a diffraction pattern such as this, where in this case the 200 plane is excited strongly, giving an intense diffraction spot.
In this case, that plane is inclined at an angle theta b relative to the incident electron beam. However, in electron diffraction, we can have another scenario where instead of the incident electron beam being inclined relative to a particular crystal plane, it is in fact parallel to many different crystal planes at the same time, with the E beam aligned on a low index zone axis of the crystalline sample. And in this case, we obtain strong diffraction on many different planes, giving a diffraction pattern with many bright spots, so called multi beam electron diffraction. And that's what we will look at in the next lecture.